can't peg it and say, well, why would you do that? Because this person you're talking to is not Buddhist. Why would you do that? And this is, this is pretty, pretty simple, you know? Um, when I tell you it's all about people, first thing, first lesson you give somebody, if you're going to explain to them how, how this oppressive feeling that person is terminally ill or they have a serious accident, they can't move and they're really, they're scared. And this, what happens next? The accident or even the terminal illness is only one diagnosis, but what comes along with that is no picnic. Because what happens is the person has a downtime and they get depressed. So let's look at this. This is a lesson for everybody. Here's a life continuum line. We're going to say life continuum line. And here's where you start and here's where you end. And this is birth, okay? And this over here, this is death. And everybody's on this line. I don't care who you are. I don't care what religion you are. I don't care what color you are. I don't care who you are. Everybody is on here and so are the animals, the birds, everybody. So here you are, you're moving along this line and right about here, you find out that you're terminal. Now, you can't joke about this with a person if they have no sense of humor. And a lot of what the person, these people who ask me these questions, they don't talk about it. Who is the person you're talking to? Somebody you can talk to about anything, a good friend or someone that's dying, that's a Buddhist that hasn't heard this before, you can be gentle and explain this to, but you have to be careful how you bring Buddhism into this. You don't need to bring it in, because watch, everything behind where you are back here, that's the past. And everything in front of you here, this is the future. Now, the two causes of suffering in the whole situation is lamenting the past and worrying about the future. But you're here, you are in the present time. Present time, okay? How many people are here now? Can you see? Whoops, wait a minute, oops. I can't open it up again. <laughs> I'm touching the right thing. Why won't it open up? Okay, here you go. Okay, let's do this first. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, we go back over here, see if it's still there. Touch <laughs> it once, touch it twice. Okay. I can't get Bunty. I can't get back now. How do I get there? I cannot get to the whiteboard. Hi. Um, uh, can you uh, just? I got it. Huh. Okay, got it. I figured it out. Okay, so what I'm trying to show you about this is showing this to somebody. When you show it to them, you ask them questions about what is the past. You ask them questions about what is the future. You ask them to tell you. Don't tell them what the past is. Don't tell them what the future is. Pretend it's a little child and they're coming to this person with a spelling bee for the first lesson and the word is past and they're asking you, what is the past? What's true about it? What you want to draw out of the person is that the past is over. It's over. It's done. It, it is, um, it, it's fixed that you're after this. You can say this to them. It's fixed in time. The, the energy is gone. The energy 
of what happened in the past, it's gone, it's gone. You know, when the tsunami happened and I went to New York to pack the trucks with the hospital equipment, um, I was very upset. And some of the Sri Lankan men came in, they said, what's wrong with you? And I said, well, this is upsetting. He said, what? I said, 250,000 people dead is upsetting to me. And he said, don't be upset. And I said, why? And they said, the tsunami works like this. It's a wave. I said, I know it's a wave. And what waves do is they come and then they might roll again and again and again, and then they're done. Waves always do that. And so the wave is gone and the energy of it is over and it's done. So we don't think about the wave, he said. We leave that alone and we only think about the present time packing the trucks and then we hope for the future, but we don't worry about the future. And I said, why not? And he said, because the future is not here right now. And we don't want the worry here. We don't want the worry. Worry wears you out. Worry takes your energy. Worry steals your sanity. So you let the worry go and you come back here and that's where you stay. And you know what? There's a movie that came out of Romania or it was in the Eastern Bloc and it was something about um, reclaiming the lightness of being, I think was the name of it. And it was about two people that had gone through the Stasi period where you couldn't even think without somebody be reporting what you said. And it was so oppressive and these people were coming out of this and they were coming alive again and the lightness and being permitted to just smile when you're on the street without somebody saying, what are you smiling at? It was that incredible, that oppressive. And all of a sudden they could think and they could talk and they could, you know, feel good. This is important because this is not supposed to be heavy. The present time is not supposed to be heavy. And one thing about this, when somebody says to you, you know, I'm terminal, the moment you hear that, you smile and you decide when it's time to let them know you're terminal too. Like, so am I, so am I. We all are terminal. We were terminal from the time we were born until we die. We are terminal and there's no way around it. And this is the way that you talk to somebody who's not Buddhist. <laughs> There's nothing Buddhist on this, on this board right now. There's nothing there. The next piece of it is about death, about finding out from the person in talking with them, are you afraid? And one of the things you very gently can teach a person about death is what I told you. Dying is not that difficult. The actual death, if you want to experience what it is, you close your eyes, you open your, you just take a breath, and then you let it out. And that's the end of it. That's the final moment. The final moment is there. Now, once you've identified the final moment, the final moment. Then you can talk about what are you gonna do up to the final moment? Because everybody's final moment, sometimes it happens in a big crash and it's sudden, but the final moment's definitely the same, okay? But in most cases in a hospital on the wards where people are dying, I, I worked in a couple hospitals, and in most cases, even in a fever, they're breathing, and then there's a breath and then it's let out and that's the end of it and that's the end. So what do you wanna do with it? Do you wanna know, you wanted to know what life was about. Do you wanna know what happens when you're moving towards this? And if, in order for you to know the final part of this journey, you have to have a clear mind. But in order to have a clear mind, if you have a lot of pain, which is what we're going to talk about tonight a lot, in order to do that, you have to have some knowledge about what's happening to you. 
And as you're moving, you want to have a clear mind and you want to, the idea is, can you help the person have a clear mind, understand this part of it? This is just all there is really. And then can you help them to see that when you are dying, what you're doing is you are giving up. I hate this. I can't get back to you. I'm supposed to be able to, and I can't. It won't let me back. <laughs> this is really funny. I go through this every time. Okay, here we go. Whoops, I gotta get you. I have to grab it. Wait a minute. Okay, there. Ooh, now I put you on the other side. That's not working. Bati, help! <laughs> this is so funny. There! Secret button. There was a secret button. I'm so proud of myself. Yes, good girl. Okay. <laughs> so what, what I'm trying to show you is once you show them the reality, the basic reality of what's happening, at that point, you have to judge the person. Can you continue to talk about this? The fear, a lot of times the fear has to do with you, the people around the bed. Fear of what's going to happen to you if I'm gone. You see? So can we leave it alone, you know? And the worst thing that people can do when you're talking about the family when do you give them the, the uh, scrapbook? When do you tell them to start building the scrapbook for the person and have the person work with you as soon as possible? And you get the family involved because they're the ones that are suffering most of the time more than the person who's dying in fear of everything with, and preoccupying themselves of a person leaving so much they have nothing to do. But all of a sudden you give them something to do and they take it and build this magnificent scrapbook and then they are building it with the person if they're conscious and then they're reading the stories people are giving them and they are sharing what's in this scrapbook with the person and it's, it's a wonderful experience. It's a wonderful experience. In most cases, this is a wonderful, wonderful experience. And then they have that afterwards. So if they're not Irish, they don't go and they don't talk about the person and have a big meal after the person dies. They've got this scrapbook and they're going, that's their solidity. They want to remember that person that way. This is really nice. You know, we have movies and stuff, but not everybody has movies. And this is how you can work with the person. And then as far as the precepts are concerned, try to remember something. Um, I was talking to my friends who are Hindu and there's a system of morality. And the person in the house where I stay sometimes is, is worshiping every morning with his morality string before he goes across the street to work where he works, you see? And this is true of the, all the different faiths have this. So in talking about morality, our precepts are basic human guidelines of virtuous guidelines for a clear mind so that you don't have hindrances coming up and, and bothering you. That's what they are, you see? And um, the other thing, if the person is Christian, if you want to, you ask a minister or you ask a priest where it is in the Bible, where the, um, where the, um, the Ten Commandments are, and you'll see the Ten Commandments string. And <clears throat> when you look at the Ten Commandments string in Christianity, you're finding something that's almost identical to what you have. The only the first one, it isn't there. And that has to do with a higher, a higher being, taking care of you instead of you being totally responsible for your life. That's what's not there. So you just leave that one off and you've got don't kill, don't steal, don't covet, don't you know, gossip, don't curse. You have it all right there. And finding it in the Bible in the New Testament, I should be able to show you where that is, but I don't have a Bible here with me. Um, 
and reading it to you the way it originally came, you're going to think you're in a Buddhist temple with your precepts in the morning. That's what you're going to think. See? So we're, we're much more the same than we are different. That's the important part of this. Now, that's enough about that part. And, um, and I think I covered it pretty well. Okay, now tonight, I'm going to talk to you about some different, um, some different, uh, actually, this is, where's Marco? Is he here tonight? I don't know if he's here. Oh, there's Marco. Actually, it's your fault. It's all your fault. <laughs> because I went in to find information about this, and Marco had a backache in 2016 in February. And he wrote me, um, and it got to be a discussion and then I wrote this, and um, so I'm gonna go find this now. Let me see if I can find it. Here we go. And I'm gonna go into it with you and just run through, and somebody needs to turn their mic off on and, or on and say, hey, wait a minute, and we'll answer a question as we go along, but it's pretty, it's pretty unique. Uh, so this is all about pain, and I'm hoping there's some people here who wrote me their letters about pain this week. <laughs> they had questions about back aches and neck aches and spinal injuries and things like that. And this is going to help you a lot. Okay. Pain really is a fascinating topic. Um, it's always fascinating when we start addressing it. And learning this meditation it can also help you with physical pain that occurs if you do not sit in the proper medically recommended positions that you've been told by about a doctor um, when, when you have a back or a neck injury. And we're not good at this. You know, we, we have an injury, we go to the doctor, they tell us what to do and we don't do it. And then we get upset because we have back pain. This is, this is what my doctors and therapists, uh, you know, trainers all tell me the same thing. So you can use your meditation to spend more time sitting without the body. If you do this, you should not sit with the pain, so to speak. It is recommended that you send forgiveness to your body and loving kindness to appreciate your body and you let it know as if it's a person inside a second person almost. You let you, you close your eyes and you thank your body for supporting you in your life. You forgive your body for the pain it is uh, giving you and uh, appreciate it. And then you support it. And by support it, I mean, you have to get across. I understand why this pain is here because now you're going to forgive it. This is about building up a healing frame, a healing frame of mind because what you think and ponder on will become the inclination and the direction of your mind in your behavior. Now, when we go to um, the first part of the Dwaita Vitaka Sutta, we're seeing that he is, um, the Buddha is in the beginning of retreats, we're always talking about this particular one, because I've shown you before that it starts out with talking about um, I abided diligent, ardent, and resolute, the Buddha is saying, a thought of sensual desire arose in me. Um, I understood this is a sensual desire that arose in me. Oh, he starts in the beginning. He says, suppose I divide my thoughts, I'm sorry, into two classes. I said on one side, thoughts of the, um, the sensual desire, thoughts of ill will, thoughts of cruelty. And on the other side, I set up thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of uh, loving kindness and of compassion, you see? So he's playing with these two kinds of feeling and he's looking at the effect it has on him in his behavior and how he's able to live. So this is a good idea for you to, in that sutta, it tells you, and I think it's on page uh, section six, the first line, what you think and ponder on um, will become the inclination and direction of your mind. What's interesting about this is today I see where they're talking about Buddhist philosophy, Buddhism is, philosophy, uh, is 
is philosophy. And then I look up philosophy and it says it's not something concrete in life. I was going back to the definition of uh, uh, philosophy and how uh, the Venerable K. Sri Dhammananda said philosophy is a lot of thinking and a lot of debating, um, but it's not a lot of doing in life, changing the way you actually are living your life. And so I can't see why they're always pressing the issue that Buddhist, the Buddha Dhamma was a philo philosophy instead of looking at the fact that the Buddha was actually the father for cognitive psychology, which is under the psychology of understanding how human beings experience everything and neurocognitive science. He's really the father of this. And he, they're proving now in cognitive psychology and in neurocognitive science that he was exactly right. Mind is the forerunner of all states. Mind made are they. You read that every morning and you begin to get it and you start watching it and then you begin to know it's really true. So you actually are creating your own experience day to day. And this is how one person says, if you learn how this works, you're in charge of your destiny. It may be pre-written if you want to believe that way, but you can change which avenue you're going to go down in life. You have decisions to make. And those decisions are going to make it easy or very hard in your life to pursue and complete this destiny, but you can actually steer it. You're not helpless. You don't just sit there and wait for stuff to happen. However, if you are communicating to the body and saying in your mind, I am sending you forgiveness and loving kindness with the intention to stop the pain, this will not work. This is where we're beginning to get into the surface of the hindrances. Although it could mildly help temporarily through a couple of attempts, usually it will stop working and fall away because this is against the principle of how things actually work in the universe. The painful feeling arose because it has a cause, an injury. And we don't get to control the truth of what is going on in our body when there is legitimate cause for it to be there. We either go against it and fight it if we do that uh, with our dislike or we accept it and support the body to be successful feeling, uh, feeling itself when, when there is something wrong. You'll be able to detect it and say, oh, that's just the body feeling this. And I know this is time for me to sit a different way, time for me to lie down and rest. It's giving you hints. You listen to your body as you learn to live. Healing begins with our mind, and this has a kind of been forgotten across time with modern medicine evolving so powerfully. The advice here is to consider stepping back and taking a clearer look at your intention within what you are doing with this meditation. We're talking about TWIM. Then you back off a little bit and with compassion for yourself, impersonally and compassionately, you send the forgiveness and loving kindness into your own body for the very sheer sake of the definition of compassion itself. So we have to review that definition that we give you about compassion for a moment. Compassion actually there are these three words, and I didn't put them in here, but when we teach about compassion class, when we have a class on compassion, we we'll always say to you there is uh, sympathy, there is empathy, and there is compassion. Remember I told you the Buddha was out to help people and to learn how to reduce suffering for themselves and others. So when you're doing this, okay, uh, he was seeing a person in pain, and in this case, you're seeing your own self when you're helping your body. 
understand I cannot stop the pain for the other person. In this case, you can't stop the pain in the body if it has a just cause for occurring in the body. Next, you're allowing your body to have a chance to pass through the cycles of pain as they occur, as it needs to, with the clear understanding that, A, this is a physical human body that is trying to heal itself, B, there is a legitimate cause for this pain to be here, and the arising pain is the logical result. So don't be angry at it anymore. That's what this is leading to. Number three, if I allow it to just be here, my body will have the space, the rest, you can make sure you rest and you take fluids and you have clean food to heal. You will have the space to heal in whatever way that it can um, correct what is wrong. I will unconditionally forgive this pain and lovingly accept and support my body and my mind to operate together in this situation. This is really great, this thing, when you break a limb and it starts to heal because there's a long period of time where the body has a lot of pain and when the pain is coming and rolling certain times a day, rolling through, it actually is a signal. I am healing you, I am healing you, I am mending, I am mending. The bone is saying it to you. The question is how do we handle it when uh, this is coming up and that's part of what TWIM is about. This does not mean that we abandon hot water bottles and cold compresses as needed, or we abandon light, slow stretching and position support practice, or added temporary back support units to wear on our back, or slow exercise if it's needed. But the idea here is to acknowledge how the body um, can help you and how you can help the body. This is what it's all, all about. And allopathic medicine, it's fine if it's giving you a reasonable amount of a little bit of relief, but I believe very strongly you need to hear your body because it's going to tell you it's time to stop, it's time to take a rest. And when we take too much of a pain relief, we're not in touch anymore. Now, if we are at a level of meditation in the third or fourth jhanas and having experienced the disappearance of our bodies and accepting that we are sometimes able to work with basic determinations of time for our sittings to help the healing proceed without any tension. And we can do this also to help ourselves. And if you can do that, it's great. If you can't do it yet, it's okay. But the more you practice, you'll get to a place where you're very comfortable with your body just not being there in certain levels in uh, infinite space or infinite consciousness. And you can just lay there and fall into these states. And when you close your eyes, you say, I will sit no higher than infinite space. Or I will sit no, inf no higher than infinite consciousness. Make sure you don't make the mistake of saying, I will sit in this level. You won't, it won't happen. Or I want to sit now in infinite space. It doesn't happen. There can be no desire at all. There can just be the idea, I, I'm gonna put a limit on where I'm sitting seems to work okay. Remaining for periods of time in such levels in which we have experienced the loss of feeling in our body can help our body rest more deeply and support us better during chronic pain cycles that have sometimes, uh, happen sometimes following serious accidents or terminally ill situations. Comment on terminally ill situations, most of the bone uh, sarcomas and um, uh, have this extremely difficult type of pain. But if you learn how to watch it, I have seen people turn off the pain medication because they know they have identified the cycle is this way, it goes like that, and then it goes like that, and then it goes like this and that, 
and goes. And they can identify it happens the same way every time. They've done research with this. And um, once you see your cycle, it's easier to uh, allow it to be happening, but paying attention to something else. Now, um, I readily use this when it came to managing the pain in my back when my discs bulged over the years and um, also committing to losing weight that exacerbated the condition a lot. It's another thing that you can do. Uh, whenever you hear it said that when you have a body, therefore you will have pain. Well, let's examine that statement because people will say, Whenever you, when you have a body, you will have pain is not necessarily true. You can have pain. It's possible in your lifetime, but it doesn't mean you have to live in pain. This statement of, uh, therefore, you will live, you will have pain. Well, you can have pain. This is true, but this is not totally pointing out that the degree of pain you experience is directly proportional to the knowledge that you have of how painful feeling turns into emotional distress and what can be done about this according to the Buddha. Now you haven't had, if you're in this class, some of you have had this, but I know there's some that haven't had the dependent origination uh, lessons and that's, it's sort of, we're getting into areas where I wish you all had exposure to this and I need to decide whether to give you um, the, the class on dependent origination, get as many people as possible in at one time to give you that workshop or have you go online to the one hour workshop that I did in 2005 or six when it was recorded. And you, you go on YouTube and you put in dependent origination workshop and this purple nun, <laughs> the purple nun will show up. And that was me back in 2005 when I was putting together these pieces of dependent origination, the links, and to, uh, you need to understand it, but I'm going to do this anyway with here. So feeling and disturbing emotions are not the same thing. Please hear this. It's very important. I like it. It's not the same as the, the identified emotions that have to do with attachment any more than I, I don't like it. Uh, you know, a painful feeling and I don't like it is just the um, a painful feeling. I'm sorry, I'm missing, I'm messing this up. Let me do it again. The feeling when it comes up is either pleasant or it's painful. And then the disturbing emo emotions occur in the, at once craving hits and craving arises with tension and tightness. And the first thing you have happen is, I don't like this. We're gonna stick with the back pain. I don't like this. That's your craving. And that turns into emotions. So what's the difference between emotions, somebody said to me once, and feeling? I had to think for a second, and then I basically said this. Pleasant, painful, those are the tones of the feelings. Emotions have names, don't they? Happiness, sadness, depression, frustration, panic attacks, they all have names. And they come, all those disturbing emotions happen from the feeling that comes up first and falls over into this craving and the clinging that comes after with craving as condition, clinging arises. So you're talking tanha and then upadana. When upadana hits, it's where your mind jumps into papancha a mental proliferation just running on and on talking about why you don't like this because it resembles something in the past and it's the same way and therefore it's going to be like this and you start worrying about if it's going to happen again in the future it's all complicated like that so to avoid these you have to understand how both of them are working they are not the same thing what we need for management of pain is to know how the hindrances operate. This is the most important part about pain. This is the most important 
because we need to take ta uh, we need to take into consideration what knowledge the Buddha taught concerning how does a hindrance operate? What's a hindrance? The nature of its nourishment. Where does it get its strength from? And what happens when you remove it? How do you remove it? How can you remove it? So the personal concern over any painful feeling makes the pain bigger and stronger. So we're still with the back and stay with us long. It stays with us longer. And this changes from our personal dislike and aversion of it to craving. I don't like it into an emotion of this is terrible. And the emotion is frustration, anger, irritability towards other people, hatred, depression, all that stuff. These are your, your emotions attacking you. Although we have much of that information the Buddha left for us about this, it is not so often that we hear about it. It uh, simply isn't included in the surface information that's taught today in many, many places. And the, and the information takes a little bit of work to find it and present it to you. So the first place uh, we want to go is to find out if he really said anything directly to the monks about a, 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 the, the disturbance or the obstruction that is happening, this, this painful thing that's happening. And it's, it's causing you distress and emotional upset. So if you go to 22, you go to 22 and you find the Alagadupa uh the simile of the snake is the simplest one to understand why the Buddha used this. And in this case, um, you have a monk, his name is Arati. Let me see where I told you. I'm just gonna keep going on here. Majima Nikaya number 22.6, section six, we hear the Buddha says to Arati, and Arati had this problem. He believed that it was okay to go and pay attention if a hindrance came up to pay attention to pain or despair or depression or a thought or a feeling, anything. He thought it was okay to go and sit with that. This is what it tells us. And the Buddha comes to straighten him out. The monks were upset. They went and got the Buddha. They had him come because the new monks were coming and uh, they didn't want him to be talking to these new monks the wrong way. And so the Buddha says to him, misguided man, to whom have you ever heard me to teach the Dhamma in that way? Misguided man, have I not stated in many ways how obstructive things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them? Aha, now we've got something here. That's, we've got something. So he is countering what Arati says directly in the beginning of the story, and he's trying to correct Arati's thinking. In the Sutta, the Buddha uses the simile of the snake to demonstrate the right way and the wrong way of doing something so that Arati can remember in the future how important it is to treat the hindrance in the right way. The Buddha gives Arati a simile at 22, Section 10 and 11, and 11, he points out, suppose a man needing a snake, seeking a snake and wandering in search of a snake saw a large snake and he grasped it by the coils of its tail. The snake would turn back on him and bite his hand or his arm or one of his limbs. And because of that, he would die and death and deadly suffering, he dies. And so why is that? because this is the wrong way to grasp a snake. But if you pick up the snake in the right way, by its neck, you pick it up by its neck, okay, you will not come to deadly suffering and death because if you're holding a snake, it's hanging down here and you've got the head, it cannot climb up and bite you. It's impossible. We need to remember that so too, if the Buddha Dhamma is being wrongly grasped by not allowing the, not following the instructions, <coughs> it will be conducive to harm and suffering for a long time. 
But when the teachings are rightly grasped, they will be conducive to your meditation, to your comprehension, direct knowledge, and to your welfare and happiness for a long time. So this lesson, the way he's talking about this, is emphasizing very strongly, you have to be following what I'm telling you, how to do it precisely. And I, I was talking to a woman who wasn't a Buddhist earlier today, and she said, well, how, what do you really mean by this? And I said, well, you know, if you and I got a recipe for bran muffins with raisins, and it was spectacular, but we took the recipe home and we did it, and it didn't turn out, and it didn't turn out, and it didn't turn out right. Something's wrong. And in the case where that happened on the farm one time where I was living, my mother-in-law and I kept making these bran muffins. We kept feeding them to the pigs, feeding them to the pigs, feeding them to the pigs. And finally, the neighbor brought over some Wesson oil. And we found out from the cook where we got the recipe the next day, we found out this recipe is only going to work with Wesson oil. It's not going to work with any other kind of oil. That was, a, that was a fact. We found out it was real. This is what the Buddha is talking about. Twim is a very simple recipe. It's very simple to see when the craving is coming up, the pain in your back, notice it. Let go of grabbing onto it and being distressed about it. Relax your head, smile, and then forgive your body. Send loving kindness into it. Let it know you're supportive of it. And then keep doing something, reading a book, reading a paper, or doing something with your hands, something, some project other than putting your mind totally on your back. If you keep going to your back, you're feeding this, the problem. Whenever there is an arising painful sensation, which is an impersonal feeling um, arising through your body sense door, and you move your personal attention over to it, you'll be feeding the sensation nutriment. And this makes it grow bigger and stronger, and it will last longer. You can test this for yourself. But when the cycle of pain begins to come up, again and if you hate it and dread it and pay attention to it it's going to hurt more it will stay there longer and if you correct your physical position just a little bit and you place your attention on doing something even just reading a book or writing or a small task or you know the cycle will come up and it will go again then sometimes there will be less pain without feeding the painful feeling and giving it your attention. So what's this saying? Basically, it's saying that the attention you give it is the food that makes it stronger. So trust me when I tell you that this is very true because I have two cracked discs in my back from past accidents and damaged neck and that can cause pain if I don't pay attention to this sort of thing. I'm a lot better now upon reading, remembering to do this as often as possible, and I have greatly reduced the necessity for treatments needed. But at first, these were very debilitating, and um, I could lose my mobility while I was here in Asia. But using this knowledge just from the Buddha, I've learned by simply acknowledging how our brain and our body connection works. I've been, and it's been really a lot, a lot of benefit. The Alagadupa Masutta in 22 is kind of fun because we hear Buddha Gautaman did not just teach this, this idea of handling something the right way or the wrong way in reference to a snake only. So he didn't just say this one time in the text. Let's be clear about this, okay? He also tells us again in Majjhima Nikaya number 54, the um, Pataliya Sutta within several other similes, and there's actually about 13 of them, offering basically the same lesson that's found in the, follow in, found in the instructions in the other one, and just asking you, follow the instructions. That's the message, follow the instructions. 
there is also a right way versus a wrong way of handling the arising of the painful feeling. He's, the Buddha was trying to get his message across to us so that we would remember how hindrances really work before we try to manage them. But if we're being taught meditation and in the meditation, somebody says you have to destroy them, annihilate them, eradicate them, suffocate them, suppress them and subdue them and make them stop. <laughs> You're in trouble. <laughs> You're in trouble. Okay, you can be in trouble for a long time because of the stress and strain this causes you when you didn't have to do it. In the case of bad backs and neck, your body needs to find out what is really going on and uh, with your pain to know if it is chronic or it is acute and what has to be guided by a doctor. But if you talk to any doctor about this this way, they're gonna understand you've got some knowledge about all of this stuff. Take some time to observe how a rising pain works in your body. Notice how suffering happens due to the arising painful feeling. It starts with a feeling, but then it turns into an emotion. Then it turns into a complex complaint. Then it turns into my habitual reaction to this, whether I get mad or angry or whatever happens. You see, it compounds. But all pain is cyclic. It isn't there. It arises, it is there, and then it subsides, and this flows in cycles. This, of course, is witnessing a Nietzsche happening here and now. This is no, there is no pain. There is a rising pain. There is pain here and now. There is disappearing pain. This is cyclic. There is a beginning, a middle, and an end of the cycle. This is a Nietzsche, watching impermanence happening, and whatever we do with the pain leads to suffering or not each time the cycle comes up. I've helped people with bone sarcomas and to deal more easily with their pains so that they can take less medication as a terminal disease uh, patient because the medicines cause this cloudy mind to happen as a side effect. And that kind of pain is not going to go away, but the real question is, how is their suffering caused and how does it operate? And can they relieve it by understanding it? And they get a lot of relief from it. It is by their personal opinion of dislike. I don't like it mine towards the painful feeling, which is the craving. Craving always manifests with tension and tightness happening as it's coming up. And then you recognize it, you release it, just let it go. And then you relax your head and you smile and come back. And what you do is um, instead of the, I don't like it, I don't want it mine. I want to stop this and the personal mind opinion and struggle getting involved the pain is there and the truth is the present time when it arises, we decide to fight with it. With the tr in, with the, if we're fighting with it, we're fighting the truth. When we struggle to make the truth be the way we want it to be, it always causes suffering. It's a guarantee. Why? Well, because this is Atta too. This is taking things personally so that we we can't make the truth, we can't make the truth change. We refusing to believe it, but that is not the truth, is it? Because the pain is there. So we are, are violating the lesson in 22 uh, of non-engagement. And what the Buddha said in that place was he told them, do not engage it. The only way the obstacle can become um, an obstruction is if you engage it personally. That's what he said in the sutta. Because the pain is there, we are so, we are violating that lesson of non-engagement. We are engaging the pain, aren't we? And, and that is why we are going to suffer more than we need to. You know, living in Asian, in Asia, I love it, but it's not a sweet trip 
when you have to stay for long periods of time in uncontrolled environments and you're my age, and uncontrolled food and uncontrolled habitat situations and uncontrolled beds. And it's something we accept in, in the monastic structure. We just accept, we take whatever we get. But it's uncontrolled and it's hard to support the back or, 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 or the uh, hard to support the back or it's, um, if it gets soft, it hurts it. If the mattress is too, too hard, which means the time to sleep, it's time to sleep on the floor. So we get, I get down on the floor and sleep on the floor for a while. I'm fine. You do whatever is necessary for the relief of the pain for sleep. There are the power outages, the lack of hot water for the shower, and unless the sun comes out where I am now, we, every few days we have hot water. <laughs> it's great. Never really appreciated hot water that much, but we really do. Otherwise, you take a bucket bath. You know, it's really like being back in the forest and just taking a bucket bath. You're dealing with heat rashes, and you discovered um, that are discovered to be more than heat heat rash and swelling of the body and difficulties of holding too much water and everything takes time to heal differently and you just determine that you're going to keep going no matter what. There are new kinds of adventures also with ants, some other little people who might occupy the floors and the funguses that we don't have at home that are picked up on the feet and you need attending to from, from too much uncontrollable humidity and you need a shower two or three times a day just to stay cool and avoid skin disorders. And I started thinking, my gosh, why am I still here? I just like it. I like it. I like being here. And are you, you consider instead of creams, you look and you say it, we should be oiling. We oil the skin instead. All these things to take care of ourselves. And this is also much different lower levels of some kinds of medical care, but the real issues, including insufficient examinations or misjudgments and conditions causing time to be lost with multiple doctors. I've been through that in different countries. It's pretty good here, actually. Um, to be overruled by natural medicines and acupuncture and Chinese herbs. But in, if you're smart, you learn to surrender to the holistic and naturopathic approach of Ayurvedics and acupuncture, because of course this makes perfect sense because the origin of this region is better known by these practitioners than anyone else. And they know about what's happening to you. Acupuncture is really good for helping with uh, pain. It's a good inexpensive remedy for pain management. And it should not be put aside because there uh, are no side effects in acupuncture. That's just period. There's no problems with it that way. Many times the person can opt to manage the, uh, the back with surgery or for, by relieving pain in this way, and it becomes part of life happily. But I don't know what they are doing with the cost now outside of Asia. It was impossible in the United States to do what they wanted to do. 30 years ago when they wanted to fix me. And I don't know, 25 years isn't bad to manage this with chiropractic and naturopathic and acupuncture and Ayurvedic approaches. So TWIM supports us to let go of our personal opinion. It lightens up our mind. And to practice living through a more practical, impersonal perspective. When you get older, you must know what is really going on in your body because then you can do a lot more with caring for yourself by using the benefits of the meditation along with such solutions. It's good for the entire system to just stop being so serious. And this means even if you are terminally ill or not, the basic fact is that death itself is part of life. This is what we forget about the, the line, the con life continuum line. Death is part of the line. It's part of the story. And this means even if uh, at the end of the life continuum line, people with terminal illnesses are not weird oddities in the human race. Step back and acknowledge that all of us are terminal. It's time for us to do that right now. We just keep on forgetting this fact.
we are. And so for as long as you are living, be sure that you are giving and not just taking from the world. We are all here to help one another to be happier and lighter with life. And we are all together facing COVID-19 now, no matter how much our governments want to play games with all of this, it's here. It faces all of us. And so do good things and stay uplifting things to others. Why not? The thing is, why do I have to be nice to her? Why not? Because it'll only take a minute and then it'll be over. <laughs> You know, and even little things lift people up and it will lift yourself up and it'll help you smile more. And so that you, you can give away your smile to someone else. Every time you smile, um, you know, David put on some questions on the online retreats uh, follow up page that we have concerning smiles. And I thought I never saw that before. Um, we, we don't usually uh, ask it directly. We just try to encourage you to keep smiling during the practice and the smiling. So we're clear about this, the smiling, what the smiling doing, the smile has to do with these muscles on the side of your mouth. When you uh, tense these two muscles in the corners of your mouth and that just like, mm, like that, it isn't like, ah, ee. <laughs> no, it's not like that. It's just tensing these muscles in the side of your mouth is releasing the, um, the frontal lobe here in the front part of your brain, releasing it just a little bit so that uh, the pineal gland can release endorphins. If you cannot release the endorphins into your brain, you never get to feel uplifted joy. You never go into the first jhana unless when you release, you're also relaxing. You release is just letting go. If I have something in my hand and I let go, I just open my hand, don't I? So I release the attention off whatever it is and then relax, smile and come back. This smile, re relax, smile and come back. Release, relax, smile and come back. That's the key for you to get into your mind. The question is about lifting people up. Maybe you never did before. The question is with COVID happening, why not? So don't, don't say, why should I? Come to me and say, I'll just say, why not? Because you can make the people in the hallway smile. You can make the children smile. You can make the gate people here or the gate on the gate are really nice to me. But it's because I smile at them all the time. And <laughs> you know, they smile back and they help me and they end up bringing things upstairs for me so I don't have to go down and pick them up when they come. And this is just because of smiling. This really is, you know? So whenever a feeling arises, it should not be surprising to you that feeling comes up. And don't be concerned about it. Whenever the feeling arises, you just say, never mind, let it go. And be tension free and smile and come back. Life begins to change. In this way, that's how it begins to change. Now, some additional references about this. Uh, checking sources, other suttas to investigate how to handle the hindrances. I gave you some notes. So if you're working in Bibi's translation, Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, if you go to number two, number four, number 22, and number 36 in section, it's 36, it should say 36 at section, start reading at section 30, I think, and read for about um, a few sections and then go to 128, you're gonna have a huge wake up call about hindrances by reading these. In 128, the key factor in 128 is he gives you 11 different hindrances and not just five. He gives you the five hindrances and the offshoots of them are six more. Okay, the sort of sub components of these five 
six more. So there's 11 hindrances appearing in 128, but there is a universal solution for all of those hindrances in exactly the same way. And um, I'll read you the last line. The, the, um, when, you, when you hear this, the last line of it, you're shocked that he's saying the same thing about each one of these universally, just as clear as if he was talking to Arati all over again and saying, do not engage. So what does he do to those hindrances in the last uh, paragraph? In number 30, section 30 of 128, when Anuruddha, I understood that doubt is an imperfection of my mind and had abandoned doubt and imperfection of mind. When I understood that inattention is um, an imperfection of mind and I had abandoned inattention, so he's saying, as soon as I realize it's an imperfection of mind, as soon as he sees that it is an obstruction, that's what this means, what does he do? It's not a lot of doing, I'm going to tell you right now. It's not a lot of doing. It's just a little bit of doing, and it's called letting go. He abandons it, lets it fall away. Abandoning it doesn't mean that you physically fight with it and destroy it, annihilate it, eradicate it. It doesn't mean that. However, there's a catch to that, I'll tell you in a minute. But what we're talking about, 11 hindrances in 128, you have doubt and then inattention and then sloth and torpor and then elation, then inertia, and he abandoned excess energy, he abandoned deficiency of energy, he abandoned longing, he abandoned perception of diversity, he abandoned excessive meditation on forms. And imperfection of the mind, I have abandoned all those imperfections of my mind. Let me now develop concentration in three ways. And he proceeds to develop his concentration, but the concentration that he's developing is composed from this word samadhi, meaning uh, tranquil wisdom, not absorption concentration, not one pointed and very hard. That's the key to this whole thing. So if you're listening to what I'm saying in the very beginning, I'm talking about seeing, if you're practicing a meditation that is not allowing you to see all of this inside while you are meditating and comprehend not just the three characteristics, but how all 37 requisites are operating and how all of this is working, you need to figure out if you want to keep doing that. <laughs> because the Buddha is saying, you know, you need direct knowledge. And then in other classes, we've told you that if you're measuring the success of your meditation, it should be comfortable and without pain. That's the comfortable meditation uh, with clear comprehension is the excellent progress. That's in the Digha Nikaya in 28 section 10. And you go there, he's, you see he's measuring how are they doing with their meditation. They're doing good with their meditation, but they're also do have to do well with their comprehension of how everything works. Because the whole secret to the whole thing he found, the escape, the antidote, it had to do with the comprehension of how everything naturally works. That's the thing. So this is uh, where we're telling you in, in the imperfections, it tells you very clearly about that. In number two, in, in number two, I think is the one where he's letting things go and he's replacing it with the wholesome. So number two, if you're practicing twim, twim is basically practicing how to notice 
unwholesome mind state in mind. Number one. Number two, release the unwholesome mind state and relax your head. Relax the mind. Number three, bring up a wholesome mind state. And number four, keep it going and continue to build more wholesome mind states. So what are the wholesome mind states? The ones without the high tightness and the tension. And what are the unwholesome ones? Whenever you say, I don't like this. I don't want this. I, I, I. So you see Atta is really uh, making a problem for you um, with the uh, fighting of the hindrances. Atta, 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 Atta. You're practicing Atta the way it's being taught to destroy something, you personally destroy it, that's atta. Now the whole principle of the teaching is to shift from atta over to anatta. That's impersonally doing it. Now look what happened here. There are more uh, suttas. These other suttas are referring to the five hindrances and you usually hear about, and also many other subsets of hindrances from the five. Uh, that uh, I know that you will recognize. And when you look into these other places carefully, you will find that if you listen carefully to this one, if you abandon the hindrance, relinquish it, release it, allow it, and let it go, let go of any attention on a hindrance, then that is when it becomes destroyed, annihilated, eradicated, and it stops. It fades away. That's when it happens. Because of the lack of any more nutriment, any more food being given to it, because you're not paying attention to it, that nutriment is your attention. So even though I wrote this to you, you have to discover it for yourself. You're not going to believe me. You can be here in the class. You're going to tell me you believe me. I don't mind. You have to go and sit. You have to see the direct knowledge yourself. You have to experience it for yourself to believe it. That's where you find it. A guy like me, I can only point. We cannot take your pain away. So you try this. You try abandoning whatever disturbs you during your day in lockdown as well and relaxing into living a bit lighter with a smile. This is about lovingly accepting the present time just as it is, and then doing whatever needs to be done. You need to clean the dishes, you need to do this, you need to do that, etc. so forth. Fine, you do it, that's it, you get done. See how your mind is then. And when you decide to live in the present time in your life, you are letting go of the weight of the past. This past morning, you're letting go of that. And pressure about worrying about the future isn't here yet. You're letting go of that. And when you practice this, you do it in terms of this morning as past, tomorrow as future, and you take advantage of the present gift that the Buddha gave you. Live in the present time for one day. Try it and you see what happens. So this is how all of this works. And um, you know, at the end, I, this, I told you this whole talk where it came from. Uh, I was trying to find, write something for someone else. And I thought I already wrote this someplace and I went hunting for it. So Mirko, he wrote me back at the end and he says, dear sister Kama, the main thing that I realized was I was expecting it to hurt again. He was in his mind, his back, when it stopped, then he was expecting it to hurt again. So I got all tight and tensed before the pain even came up. So when letting go of this expectation and coming to the relaxed state, I didn't exaggerate it. The pain just happens. That's the cyclic pain happening. And so he liked the part about seeing the person in pain, in this case yourself, and allowing yourself the space that you need to pass through the cycles of pain as they occur with a clear understanding that this is a physical body, a shell and anatomy. This is the cause for this pain to be here. It has a cause and it is legitimate. 
and unconditionally forgiving and lovingly supporting yourself. You think about that. You put a sign up and you start doing it for a few days. You see what happens when your mind is pondering that instead of, oh, it's gonna come again. Oh, the next problem, what am I gonna do? <laughs> yeah, that's where we go with this. But we have to get in changing our habit of expecting it to. So I told him, I said, you know, that's neat that you see to see you start reading the Dhamma while there is pain, it's a good one. It's, I'm so glad that you go back and you read it again and again. 128 is what we were talking about at the time this all happened. And, and go back again to, um, go back again to, to um, I'm going to get you all. Wait a minute. <laughs> I know there's a way to do this. Help our Dika, quick. <laughs> Okay, I can do it special way. I have a special way to do this. <laughs> I'm getting smart in my old age. Uh, I'll do it with. Uh, there. <laughs> okay, I did it. Is that right? Okay, I did it. Is that right? Okay. So do you have any questions about this? Because this is how all of the hindrances work this way. We can take you through uh, doing this some other time. We'll do it again because people need to hear it as often as possible. There's probably between nine and 11 suttas that sit inside the Majjhima Nikaya that are telling you how to handle it perfectly, okay? There's only one in the whole book. This is what fascinated me when I went to research this. Uh, there is only one sutta that is in the Majjhima Nikaya that's going to tell you to really get rough with the hindrances. It's illogical. It isn't supported. There's 152 suttas in this book. And it is just not logical to assume that that sutta is real and it belongs there because nothing supports it all around it with 151 other suttas. When you see that happening, then you begin to scratch your head and you say to yourself, the first hundred and some odd years or something, they were orally protecting the teaching. But the moment they put it into writing, they had a problem because in some monastery, somebody can change what's written and there's nobody around who is gonna stop them from doing that. And so look at what happened with the Bible. When I was growing up, there was one King James version of the Bible. By the time I was out of high school and in my twenties, when I was going back and looking, uh, when I, the first time I was look, getting into religion and uh, comparative religions and things, there were 11 copies in the bookstore that were different translations. And we face the same thing now in Buddhism, we do. When you go back to these uh, books, these are pretty much respected pretty universally that as being closest to what the Buddha was saying, what he, he said. When you go up, depart to some of the other traditions and then you look at what's happened in the last 20 years have been devastating uh, with no control over who decides to translate and put stuff on the internet, there's no control. And so some people, uh, I remember one translator was shocking me. I had known about uh, him for some time and uh, the, what shocked me about it was when he put it out there nobody stopped him. And when I went and read what he was doing with the translation of the Majjhima Nikaya, I went back to him and I said, why did you do this? And I said, why did you do this? And I went to several suttas and why did you change this so drastically? You know the answer? I did the translation to fit my personal experience. And I was boggled. I was boggled in my brain because we were working so hard to find out what the practice was in the text that you could do and you could find, you could experience for real experience the descriptions of what happened in these books but this person just decided, I'm great, I'm marvelous, this is what I experienced, so I'm gonna translate it to match my experience and then I'm gonna go teach people, that's it. 
That was amazing to me. So where are we? Where exactly are we in the development line of all of this, you know, 5,000 years, whatever. And we're at 2,600 years, uh, but computers have exacerbated it. The internet has, you know, made it so anything goes and can happen. And when I talked to you before about the dispensation and what is the dispensation? The dispensation is over when, when everything is absolutely gone. Everything, and people are just walking around with little amulets around their neck with an orange amulet piece of cloth inside of, you know, plastic or something, hanging around your neck and saying, I'm a Buddhist. And monks, they're not there anymore. There aren't any anymore that can tell you anything about what this was, how it can help you, how you can use it day to day. And there might not, I don't know if there'll still be a retreat, but just when you even try to look at how vast this is, you see? And that's why I think we're so lucky with Bonte. We're just so lucky. I, of all the people I could have ended up with in the United States as a teacher, and I, I have been ridiculed for staying with one teacher for 20 years. I want you to know that. But I turn it around and I say, in the old days, <laughs> this was what you did. You know, you were a, um, in white for two years until the teacher knew you. And then you were a Samanera for a couple years. And then you decided if you were going to do the, uh, with the teacher in the same spot. I want to emphasize this. And after that, you became a higher ordination if you chose to. And you kept going from there, okay? But you always stayed rooted to that same teacher. And when you had a higher ordination, if you did, you, uh, what I did was two years in seminary, and then I decided to stay seminary. Why did I do that? I'll tell you. Because any monk, is allowed to sit down and talk to me about Dhamma if I'm a seminary. Anybody can. And I've talked to monks all over the world very comfortably. But if I'm a bhikkhuni, fully higher ordination, it's not so easy for them to feel comfortable to sit down and talk to the bhikkhuni. It's not so easy. And there's a lot of rules about this too. And I try to be very respectful with monks in temples when I talk to them. It's, you know, venerable, may I have permission to discuss this? And if they've asked, even if they've asked me to come and teach and give a lesson in a temple, I will still say to them, venerable, do I have your permission to teach in front of those monks? And the monks understand what I'm doing. And then they'll say, you, have, you granted, yes. And I teach. It's a little thing. But it's very important because it does, it shouldn't be breaking down. But the point is, I'm not going, I've met many teachers and questioned many higher monks about many of the points we're showing you. Okay? And they don't have any trouble talking to me. But when I hear about uh, other uh, nuns sometimes trying to talk to them, it doesn't go so well. <laughs> The one thing, if you really want to chase a monk away fast, is you sit down to speak to him about anything and you ask the question. Before we have a discussion, what is your position on gender equality? And sometimes the monk who doesn't want to hear this, okay, just stands up and fixes his robe and walks away. Now, it doesn't mean he doesn't agree, but what it does mean, I finally figured out, when you ask that question, you are basically saying, I have not discovered yet. There's no sex in the monastic system, whether it is Theravada, Mahayana, or Vajrayana. There is no female or male that exists. It was all just set up that way to keep things organized, is what I see. You see, do you get, I hope you get what I mean, because <laughs> I'm not anti-equality at all. But if I know I'm not a man or a woman, and he knows he's not a man or a woman, we could talk all night. <laughs> and
And that's what has happened in some places, three or four hours of discussion on dependent origination or anatta or many different things. But I'm still greeted with Dhammasukha. I'm still, Bhati is the teacher. The man, why would I go to any other teacher is the big question I have. Once you find a teacher who explains this to you the right way and you find out this really works and this is absolutely real, why would you start going around from teacher to teacher to teacher to teacher to teacher? But in this day and time, people like complex resumes. <laughs> they do. I'm a personnel, professional personnel um, counselor and I've worked with big companies and sometimes it's very impressive in some types of things in the world to have 20 or 30 teachers listed on that you did this. But my question, you know, with Bhati, I don't understand it sometimes unless the person hasn't figured a couple of these things out. And the, the thing was, this is all coming back to a tiny little recipe. And this tiny little recipe has six steps like a cake mix has six ingredients. Change one step and it doesn't work the same way anymore. That's it. Questions? Any questions at all? I'm going to trick you guys. Uh, probably I am going to trick you guys. Uh, coming soon because you're going to have to come to the class with a question and before I start the class I'm going to ask each one of you to give a question on put it on the chat and ask Bhante uh, Dhamma Gavesi to write them all down. I'm going to find the questions because I know you have the questions. <laughs> I mean you know we came back with um, something like 190 questions from eight retreats. And we were in three countries this time. I know those questions are there. So where are you on this? Do you, do you understand this about the hindrances? Do you understand what he said? Hmm? Somebody needs to tell me. <laughs> do you understand it? Yeah? How about you, Benjamin? Do you understand it? <laughs> Yeah? I think I do. Yeah? Have you tried it? Have you tried it this way? Um, I've noticed it. I'm also, I'm still currently practicing my forgiveness meditation. Yeah? Uh, that Venerable Dharma Vigesi got me on and it's been helpful as well. And I think listening to some of the talks um, the last few weeks also, you've mentioned many times, right, not to fight with um hindrances thoughts and i think i've trying to break that habit um because you know my my typical meditation will involve a thought coming in at some point and taking me on a journey and then i make it wrong when i when i sort of realize what i've done like i've kind of um taken that road that ride with the thought and then you know oh, i forgot to do this i need to do that and then I've realized, oh, I've totally gone away from whether it was my metta meditation or my forgiveness meditation. I try and do the six R's, come back. Mm -hmm. I think I used to combat it a bit. Okay. Now, in forgive, how many of you are practicing forgiveness? Can you just put your hand up for me? How many of you? How many of you are doing that right now? One, two, three, four, five, all right. The biggest thing that sort of crashes us with, um, with forgiveness meditation is when we learned to do metta, we were practicing the six R's to learn them first. If you were listening to us, we're even going so far to tell you the truth that no hindrance arising has any information in it at all. A valuable, this is in the text too, in certain suttas, that is important enough for you to move over there and get some kind of information from it. Okay? So knowing there's no information in anything that arises or you feel, you, you see, hear, smell, touch, taste, or feel, or that pops up in your head, the moment you realize there's 
an imperfection on its way, abandon it, which meaning let go, relax, smile, come back. We're doing this on everything in metta as soon as we can get you to do it. Then if you get blocked and you have to go over to do some cleansing using the forgiveness, this changes, right? This changes because now it's important if you understand the forgiveness has three parts to it. And all of these are done. I want you to see how all three parts of, of, of forgiveness, it's a great uh, generosity thing, the practice of forgiveness. It's not just for me, me, me. It's a great practice of generosity. Number one, you're going to forgive yourself. You're going to be generous to yourself. Get it? Okay. Number two, the second level, when somebody else comes up and when something comes up, it's not always a person, is it? So if it's an event, you have to see, re remember who was in that event. If there's six people, you don't bring a group up. It never works. But you, the person intuitively, you will choose the most important person. You bring them up immediately and say the phrase to them. Aha, now you're being generous to that person. So there's a second step of generosity. Now, the third one's a little tricky because the, when you keep going with that person and keep going with them until they actually forgive you. Now, when someone forgives you, you do not refuse to accept it. You accept the generosity toward yourself from someone else. That's extremely important when someone tries to give you something. Even if you don't want that pink shirt with purple elephants and yellow birds all over it, you accept it. And then it, once it belongs to you, give it to someone else. The so funniest story of all was when my brother-in-law died, my sister-in-law, my sister, she went in to clean up his clothes and my mother had given him silk pajamas for 13 years. And no one ever bothered to tell my mother, he sleeps in the buff. <laughs> He doesn't ever wear pajamas. Nobody knew this, you know, was happening. She, my mother was happy as anything. And so my sister got 15 or 20 sets of silk pajamas in packages that had never been opened when she cleaned the room. You see, he should have been giving them to someone else who, need, who needed them and wanted them. You see, that was, they didn't know that. Some people think it's wrong to ever give away what somebody gives to you. So anyway, you have these three points of generosity. So do you see what's happening when something comes up in forgiveness? You don't automatically let it go, relax, smile, and come back and keep forgiving. You understand. You have to remember that. Otherwise, you will never be able to complete the forgiveness program. We have tried a couple times. Now, I know David has a, um, a retreat that he gives for forgiveness, and I'm thinking about doing it too. But we decided, when I say we, Bonte and David and I, all came from different places together in our minds, bumping and saying, you cannot take a person and just teach them to do our forgiveness circle meditation unless they already know about the six R's. You cannot do it. So taking them without teaching them twin first, they need to have to be trying to do the six steps in, in six hours in the twin. Then you need to make sure that you straighten them out about when something comes up, you have to look at it first and then you let it go. Relax, smile and come back. Okay? Always remember that. It's a little tiny thing, but it's really important. If you don't do it, you never get to number two and you can never reach number three. <laughs> you see? Now, and some people, question, mm -hmm, yep. Question, question. So is it normal in the practice? Is there, um, so what I was learning from uh, Bhante Vimalaramsi's video was you, when you sit down, you meditate and you choose a, a term like, I forgive myself for not understanding and you repeat that. Mm -hmm. And then Venerable mentioned you do the walking meditation and then you, you do the right foot. I forgive you, you forgive me. Can you right. do the I forgive you, you forgive me also while sitting or is it better to do yeah. walking? This is for a walking, you know, that, that's just a mantra you're sitting there doing. Um, we want you to 
always walk in between your sittings. We don't want you to say, I, I can be home today and I'm going to sit 17 times and not walk. We want you to try to learn to balance your body and you're sitting so that your circulation is always moving, especially in the COVID situation. Even if you're running up and down stairs, you know, to get your blood moving. And I have a terrible time right now because I'm sitting too much and I swell up and I have to take a water pill. And I, I actually, actually, I finally figured out I'm allergic to chia seeds. Can you oh. believe it? So the chia seeds apparently were triggering swelling in the arms and all over me. Really, that's the only thing I changed. So I ran some tests about it, experiments, and that's what it is, is the chia seeds. So what I'm trying to tell you how important this is to keep your body circulation comfortably running so you don't have cramps and you don't have swelling happen and stuff like that. And when you get in that condition in your body, you're affecting your brain too. It affects everything, okay? So I want you to walk when we're saying, I forgive you, you forgive me. I forgive you, you forgive me. You can sing along with Mitch <laughs> or you can just say it. But what you're doing is pounding your head saying, forgive, 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 forgive. And you used to be grab on, grab on, grab on, grab on, grab on, crave, crave, cling, cling. <laughs> you see, it was like bells inside your head. So now we're just saying, you know, let go, let go, let go, let go, let go. <laughs> and this is forgive, 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 forgive. These are points that you have had in your head, neural pathways in your brain since three or four years, or years old, watching people and by eight years old, locked in place. But what the news is in modern brain research is that the neural pathways in your brain are not fixed. That's a wow. We thought they were fixed. And this is where the person comes to you and says, what are you people talking about change? People can't change. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, you can change. You need to know how it works to change. And when you're doing forgiveness, also it's fun to understand. It's kind of nice to know about the functions of the brain and you can look online. Um, up, there's a good place to go to learn a little bit about this. Go to YouTube and you put in, how do I change a habit if I'm over 25? That's a good place to start. And it'll bring up little sets of summaries of research. When you fish through them, the methodology for what they're finding in the research is always the same. The neural pathway is thick and it's in there and it's established that you are a person with ang who needs anger management. <laughs> you got an angry streak and your, your neural pathway is like this wide, really, really wide. It's like your thumb, okay? And um, the question is, what are we going to do with this person? We're going to teach them loving kindness. We're going to teach them forgiveness, loving kindness and compassion now. So if you picture this, the best picture I ever saw was... Um, the woman put up a picture and she said, what we found was a beautiful sidewalk going through the park, you know, through the woods, like the woods behind me, a beautiful sidewalk going through that people walked from one side of the uh, big park in New York to the other side on this beautiful sidewalk through the forest. And that's your anger pathway. <laughs> okay. Now you want to be loving kindness and forgiveness to operate and overturn this. So how do you do that? You simply start doing the loving kindness and compassion. This is why retreats don't work. Retreats are never going to take anybody to Nirvana. It doesn't happen. If they don't take it home and keep doing something all the time to retrain the mind, you just learn this much and fall down and learn this much and fall down. It's like a roller coaster for your all of life. I know a man, he goes three times a year for a three for a 30 day retreat. He still can't understand why he isn't fully developed. And I try to explain it to him this way. So the new neural pathway at first is like a piece of hair. I don't have one, but if anybody has hair, you take one piece of hair uh, in grid pool, one piece of hair, and that's how big it is. 
It's only that big, okay? Then it gets to be a thread, and then a piece of string, and then it gets to be thicker, and then a piece of rope, and it starts to get thicker and thicker. And now it's a footpath through the park. And she made up a story where there's a beautiful, they saw a beautiful crystal rock that was uh, quartz rock that was in the park. And it, when they were walking on the sidewalk through, everybody saw it, but nobody went to see it. See? because it wasn't on the sidewalk. So these people decided when we go to work, we're gonna cut through over here on this little tiny path and sit and be right in front of the quartz crystal rock when the sun comes up. Fantastic, they were telling everybody. But it's just a tiny little footpath and a lot of people didn't even wanna go over and see it. They didn't even wanna try. They didn't believe they could get from where they were to the other side unless they followed the sidewalk. Now the sidewalk, when you're in a forest, especially in Asia, you can see this happening very quickly. We're not going, and this, and this is like a little resort, a tiny closed up resort with a wall around it. And inside, it's absolutely gorgeous. Outside, if you, I walk the pavements sometimes, and there are sections where the jungle just comes over it in a week or two with the monsoon, all the water just grows right over the sidewalk really fast. So. The point is, she was saying, the woman who wrote the story, my sidewalk is going to disappear. It's going to be covered up with shrubs and it's going to be gone and nobody's going to be able to find it. And pretty soon, everybody will be going over to see the rock in the morning and it's going to get wider and wider and used more and more. And she said, this is what's happening to your neural pathways. Is that the new MRI uh, film, the, the most expensive, not most expensive, the most powerful cameras now can see the neural pathways and can see how they shrivel up and die and then they fall off. That's the end of your anger. And then now you have another path you're working with. You see? So this is a reality. It's not a theoretical piece of scientific theory anymore, like the Buddha was talking about uh, when we talk to you in Samhita Nikaya and we tell you how he figures out how the anger works. So the Buddha not, not only figures out that the way you have to do it is through continual repetition of the same exact way in suttas, the repetition and repeating and drilling and everything again and again to understand it. You see, if you, you know Chachaka Sutta, how many of you know Chachaka? How many of you know Chachaka Sutta? Right, most of you, if you've been in a retreat, you heard Chachaka Sutta. So what is he doing with these monks? What, what is he doing with them? It's 148, okay? And what is he doing with them in order to teach them about the Atta and Anatta? How is he training them? And this, every point, Every point, that is in the 37 requisites of enlightenment. If you're gonna learn it the way the Buddha wants you to learn it, internally, completely, utterly, completely, has to be done with repetition and repeated use all the time. So then I said to, the, I said to one monk, well then what happened here? Why do we have retreats and they go home? He said, what do you mean? I said, did they have retreats back then? No, they didn't have retreats in the beginning. You went and you practiced and practiced and practiced until you got it going is what we believe. And when it switched into automatic, you went back to the goat herd and back to the store and back to the, to the palace to work and be the chancellor and help the king. Because it was working all the time. The, the, we know that the six R's, if the person follows the instructions and does it all the time, their neural pathways will change. And the, if you are do, following everything we're telling you, you're gonna start sensing it, the brain will sense it. You don't ask it to pop up and start sending somebody uh, loving kindness who used to be harassing you and your wife when you took a walk and they drove by and they shouted profanities. But all of a sudden one night for some reason, instead of getting mad at the van, you turned and smiled and you started sending them and they stopped in their tracks. They stopped yelling. And it wasn't any fun anymore because you were just smiling back and you weren't even gonna say anything. And then a student in that case called me up and said, what the heck just happened? <laughs> and I said, explain and explain the incident. And I said, your brain, just crossed the hypothetical line and it automatically ran the six R's. 
That's where you're trying to go in life. So that your brain is completely brainwashed into believing that it will be more comfortable and everything will work better if you forgive and let go, relax, smile, come back. That's why you train your mind to never mind. Never mind. Why pay attention to something that's happening, good, bad, or indifferent? Why pay attention to something that is happening if you know a Nietzsche is real? Think about that for a minute. Why would you keep trying to make it stay there longer if you know it's just going to arise, be there, and pass away? You know the secret of the beginning, the middle, and the end. The perfect beginning, the perfect middle, and the perfect end. You already know we're telling you the antidote and the escape, not just the antidote hypothetically, we're showing you the escape. And what he experienced in New York was an automatic escape and that really tipped these guys off that were in the van. They were always harassing people in the evening when the people took walks and they just went away. Okay, what I'm talking to you about, how do they drip? Why do we tell you the six sets of six Chichaka Sutta 148? Why do we tell you this is a drill system? The origination of the identity. This is what he's doing with all six of the all six of the sensors. He's starting out by saying, monks, this is the way leading to the origination of identity. Now he's going to show the monks how they got in trouble with personal identity. One regards the I thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. You grow up that way. You saw your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your aunts, your uncles, and your grandparents doing it. So you did it. You just did it. One regards forms thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. Then one regards the eye consciousness, the eye contact, the eye feeling, and the eye craving. And each time you're doing, going through this piece by piece, you're saying, we're regarding it how? We're regarding it, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. Next section, the monks are wondering, well, if that's what happened to us in their minds, they're saying, well, how can we get out of this? So the, monk, the, the Buddha gives another section, and this one, he's going to show them the cessation of this identity, how it happens. Oops, I made a missed one. Did I miss one? I missed one. Okay. Well, this I'll do these two first. He's going to show them the cessation of the identity now, how they get out of this. <laughs> one regards the I thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. And then one regards the forms they see and they know this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. And then they regard I consciousness. So the monks are actually being told. I see this as they are being told tomorrow when you get up and you go out, and start practicing or moving around the house or planting the garden or going up and sitting and coming back. On the way out, on the way back, everything you're doing, can you work with this during the day and understand this is not mine, this is not, I am not, this is not myself. And the forms and the consciousness and the contact and the feeling and the craving of the eye and then the ear and then the nose and then the mouth and then the body. Can you work through this drill? And that's what he had them doing in that school. Sariputta and Mogalana had them doing this until they really got it. All of a sudden they knew it. They got it. It was internalized, okay? The very first one, he starts by outrageously demonstrating not self. This was the first one. If anyone comes to you and they try to tell you the I is self, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of the I is seen and understood. And since its rise and fall are discerned, it would follow. Myself rises and falls, and that is why it is not acceptable for anyone to say the I is self, and thus the I is not self. And next we do, if anyone says the forms I see are myself, that, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of the forms is seen and understood. I see the form, I see it rise, I see it go away. That is why myself doesn't rise and fall. 
he's almost like, I know you're not an idiot. <laughs> you didn't rise and fall when you saw this thing rise and pass away. You didn't personally rise up and then pass away too when it passed away. So how can you be that I? How can you be that self? Hmm? How can that be yourself? How can you be the forms you see? How can you be those things? And he does that to them. He's got them scared. And then he says, you have this problem with the origination of identity. You grew up with it. And then he says, now here's how you get rid of it. This is a set of drills. Nobody can argue with me on this. I've done it myself. I've gone out in the woods and worked all day and done this thing. It was the first one I memorized. And then what happens is he takes you into a little deeper and he says, I'm going to show you what makes it impossible for you to be able to reach Nibbana. That's the first large section and the other section is what makes it possible. So what is it that makes it impossible for you to get to Nibbana? Dependent on the I and forms, I consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. And with contact as condition, there arises a feeling felt as pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant. When one is touched by a pleasant feeling, if one delights in it, welcomes it and remains holding to it, then the underlying tendency to lust lies within one. That makes sense, doesn't it? Then he says, when one is touched by a painful feeling, if one sorrows, grieves, and laments, weeps, beating one's breast, and becomes distraught, then the underlying tendency to aversion lies within you. I thought that was pretty extreme until I recalled the way I lived when I was 13, 14, and 15. <laughs> and I truly was beating my breast and weeping and totally distraught over the situation that I was going through. It was horrible. <laughs> but when one is touched by a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, if one does not understand as it actually is, now what is it that you don't understand? Listen carefully. You don't understand the origination of phenomena the disappearance of it, the gratification, the danger, and the escape in regards to the feeling. And the, then the underlying tendency to ignorance lies within you. What does it mean? It means you do not understand dependent origination, which teaches you how something arises, how it exists, how it passes away how you get personally involved with it, and how it causes suffering or not. Because that one shall here and now make an end of suffering without abandoning the underlying tendency to lust for a pleasant feeling, without abolishing the underlying tendency to aversion towards a painful feeling, without extirpating the underlying tendency to ignorance in regards to a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, Without abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, this is impossible. So you have to do this six times when you memorize it. Six times, one for each one of the sense doors. And then when you do the next one, it's a simple change. If you listen to it, this is a simple change. Dependent on the, um, okay, let's, dependent on the ear and sounds, ear consciousness arises. The meaning of the three is ear contact. With ear contact as condition, there arises a feeling felt as pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant. When one is touched by a pleasant feeling, if one does not delight in it, welcome it and remain holding to it. Then the underlying tendency to lust does not lie within one. When one is touched by a painful feeling, if one does not sorrow, grieve, and lament, does not weep beating one's breast and become distraught, then the underlying tendency to aversion does not lie within one. When one is touched by a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, when one understands as it actually is, 
the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape in regards to that feeling, then the underlying tendency to ignorance does not lie within one. Monks that one shall here and now make an end of suffering by abandoning the underlying tendency to lust for pleasant feeling, by abolishing the underlying tendency to aversion towards a painful feeling, by extirpating the underlying tendency to ignorance in regards to the neither painful nor pleasant feeling, by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, this is possible. He, was, he didn't leave anything out. He told you right there what you had to do. You have to learn through a meditation which allows you to see. And through direct knowledge, you will understand how any phenomena originates to dependent origination. And then how it disappears dependent origination again, okay? The gratification, how you have gratification of it happen, you get personally involved in it, you read MN18, read the Madhu Pandika Sutta, it will tell you how war happens and how peace happens between two people or two million, it doesn't matter. And then the danger, what is the danger of that? What is the danger is you will be letting, losing your present time. That's your danger, okay? And the escape, and what is the escape? Ardika, what is the escape? What is it, what is it? <laughs> Come on, it's six R's, right? It's twin. It's practicing right effort with the correct definition. Now, is the definition they're using for right effort, is it wrong? No, not really. <laughs> because if you're teaching the general public about life and using the Eightfold Path to teach the broader lay community how to live, they need to put diligence and they need to put effort into everything that you do in life to be successful. Isn't that true? But so the way I see it, it's just my reasoning, when we lost the practice and it wasn't working fluently anymore and moving down the path and experience, having people experience the different levels of attainments anymore, when that happened, everything slid downwards. <laughs> everything that you want to talk about this slid downwards. We lost the escape. We couldn't see the antidote anymore. We had a big move of people who wanted to say that this whole thing is pessimistic. There's nothing pessimistic about this at all. Nothing. Okay. And um, when that all happened, then what happened is right effort just slipped away. I was talking to the highest monk in Singapore in the Theravada system, the highest monk over teaching in Singapore about two years ago. I sat down and just said to him, sir, could you explain to me, please, Samoyama? Could you tell me what it means? And the answer was, it means to work hard at whatever you do. Do it with virtue, work hard and earnestly be diligent and persevere in your life. Now he's not wrong. However, he knew I was a meditator and that's not something that you tell a meditator because that right effort has four steps repeated in sutta upon sutta upon sutta. And what it's telling you is to, I'll, I'll read one of them to you so you understand the dilemma because there is really a dilemma about this. <laughs> you know, because you can't cheat. I can't tell, not tell you without letting you listen to it one time. So you go to 77 because all of them are in there. Everything's in there. Number 77. And you find right effort. And always remember that right effort and right striving are the same thing. They're absolutely, positively, unequivocally the same thing. They're the same exact paragraph. <clears throat> so the four kinds of striving 
He's talking about the four steps of right effort. These are the, when you're, when you are practicing to recognize the unwhole. So, so he says, He's teaching Udayan. We're always teaching Udayan. <laughs> the Buddha's teaching Udayan. I have proclaimed to my disciples the way to develop the four kinds of striving. Here, a monk awakens enthusiasm. It says zeal, but we say enthusiasm, okay? For the non-arising of unarisen, evil, unwholesome states. So that means you practice in a way so that unwholesome states don't arise anymore. That's what it means. He makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind, and he strives. So when you make an effort to remember the instructions for twin, for the six steps, you arouse your energy when you're practicing and you bring up your steps. You exert your mind to doing the six steps in twin. That's where this is. And then you strive to do that step. But this striving is much easier than heavy duty, um, back breaking striving that gives you a headache. <laughs> this is much different. Striving is a strange word. To strive means to work hard. You do not have to work hard. You need to know. You know did you ever hear the saying in Asia? Do they have the saying, work smart? Um, like, don't work hard, work smart. Do you know that from college and maybe from business and CEOs and medical school and stuff like that? Don't, don't break, don't break yourself working so hard. Don't work so hard. Work smart, not hard so that you can continue to work. That's what your medical people have to do in COVID. They have to be smart and accurate. They have to work very you know, smart in order to survive right now and continue taking care of people. No question about it. That's what this is talking about when we're talking about TWIM. Then it, he awakens enthusiasm and aban uh, for the abandoning of the arisen unwholesome states, okay? He makes an effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind, and strives. Same thing. And that's a lot of energy because what we do is this. We let go and we relax. <laughs> so it's not, doesn't take a lot of energy to do this. But it is energy. You've got to remember to let go of it. You see? So that's what this really was in the beginning. You just let go of it and you relax your head. Okay? And then... You, he's uh, making effort, energy, exerting his mind and striving to do that. How much effort and energy does it, striving, it's not like striving, you just kind of do it, you know? You're just holding into it, you're holding onto it, you're craving it, you let go of it. You relax, smile and come back, right? He awake, now, the, now the third step, he awakens enthusiasm for the arising of unarisen wholesome states he makes an effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. And what does he do? He smiles. <laughs> That's what he does. He smiles. The instant, it, there's two things you're doing. Two instant arising of wholesome states. You are smiling and coming back. And what are you coming back to? You are coming back, okay, to the most wholesome thing you could be doing in your life. And that is your meditation object of meditation, right? So smiling and the object of meditation, that's what you're coming back to, okay? Third one, he awakens enthusiasm for the continuance, the non-disappearance and strengthening, increase and fulfillment by development of arisen wholesome states. He makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strides. What does that all mean? It means you make an effort to keep going with your meditation and you don't leave it and go to the hindrances at all. You stay right here. Like you are in a canoe and I put you in the river and I told you to go to the ocean. <laughs> stay in the boat and keep going with the meditation. Don't look over here and look over there. Don't worry about the Indians. They won't shoot you with arrows. Okay, just, just keep paddling down the river towards the ocean and you will get there.
See? But if you keep going over here and going over there and going over here and going over there, it's a problem. Now, I mean, you're going to have times, but do you see the instructions? Do you see where TWIM came from? But it's disconcerting because of the description and some of the words used in this description are not in the original Pali. And if we go back, it's not quite as seriously hard and it's influenced by the commentary some that made everything sound so hard about the hindrances. You can't get angry at the commentary because when they put the commentary together about 1300 years after the Buddha was gone, they took 125 commentaries that all had ideas about this and no arahats left then when this happened. And they put consent, condensed this all together. And by then a lot of people didn't know anymore about the hindrances. They weren't reading the text once this book comes out. And then you say to yourself, how can one book take over everything? It's because of the way he wrote it. And he copied uh, the, um, the first one. What is the first? Second one's the, the Sudimaga. And the um, Vimudimaga was first. The Vimudimaga came first. And when we examine the Vimudimaga, it's organized sensational. He gets an A plus, plus, plus. So that's what they took, we think, that's what they took, and they tried to copy the game plan, the formatting of the Vimuni Maga, and they built the Vasuni Maga, okay? That's what they did. And um, you have somebody, is like, uh, we need a new program for the computer, I'll put it to you this way, and to do it, we have to have a senior, senior, senior programmer come and do it. <laughs> So they put out a job listing to find somebody who was the best poly scholar anywhere and for translating for this job to take these, these things out of a library and condense them into one book. That's what happened. So he did it. And when he did it, he, he went back, he pulled some people from the mainland over to Sri Lanka to help him do it from where he was before. And you got to remember now, he was a Brahmin, he was a Hindu before he was a Buddhist. And he went and became a Buddhist monk, only to get the permission to study with the monk who was the greatest Pali scholar of this time. That's what he had to become a monk. That's how he was a monk. So then he's not, if he is practicing any meditation, it's perfectly logical for us to assume he's practicing what he learned as a Hindu when he grew up. And what he learned as a Hindu was, a, it was the Brahmins were doing a one-pointed concentration, you see? And they were doing that kind of thing. And it, if you want to read the, the descriptions of how serious that was, oh my God, you read the first half of uh, 36. Majima Nikai number 36, you read it from the beginning up to number 30. And then when you get to, pay, to section 30, you hear for the first time, there must have been a very big change that took place suddenly before he was awakened. And that's the description right there in front of you. 30, 31, and 32, I think it is, isn't it? I think it's 30. And that's exciting. When you find that, you read the front part, you want to cry. You want to cry. He was working, the Buddha, uh, Siddhartha was working so hard, man, he was passing out. And we all know that he was starving himself and he wasn't eating and he was doing all this extreme stuff, really, really extreme stuff. Nothing left of him but a skeleton. All of his skin had turned black. It was beginning to peel off. He's no hair on his at all anymore, nothing, you know? It was horrible. And at 30, you start to, um, 31, start at 31, you have this big thing that all of a sudden happens, which he remembers something. And when he, it's what he remembers that changed everything. It changed everything. When that hit him, then he goes back and sits again after he gets some food and he takes a bath and they come and feed him and all of that. Then he goes and he practices one more time. And when he's very shortly, he gets through, you see? But why did he get through is really obvious at 
uh, 31 and 32. That changed his position. It changed his position of thinking about pleasurable sense pleasures and what sense pleasures were okay and what sense pleasures were not okay. That's, that's where you find out what, it, what it's about, you see? Yeah, we could keep going all night, but do you want to have any more questions? <laughs> you know, because so this is where I knew a monk in North Carolina. He used to go to the university and he would stay there for 10 hours. And the thing is, I could never understand. I never went to it. And people would come and go all day, but, you know, he never went horse. He swore to me that he told me I never went horse. There's something going on when we're teaching Dom and we have all this energy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he didn't go horse. To me, it's exciting to share with you these, these like um, hallmark points that we found in different places and have you tie them together. And what we're going to do from now on, this is why, okay, Bunty, Dama uh, said to me, but you were supposed to do something in relationship to the Four Noble Truths. All right, so let me ask you something. Did I show you suffering tonight? I know. Did I show you suffering tonight? I did, didn't I? Did I show you the cause of suffering in the hindrances when I explained it? I did, didn't I? Did I show you the cessation of that? I did, didn't I? And did I show you a path to the cessation of that in different ways? I did, didn't I? That's what I'm talking about when I say he has a teaching method. It's compact and it's very simple. You don't, it didn't really bring the um, Eightfold Path in, but I showed you how to do the cessation by talking about TWIM, you see? By talking about the Samawayama, which is including the, the, um, the TWIM and the mindfulness and the concentration level. So, you know, I see the Buddha as he's testing his, his concentration like somebody in an airplane hangar testing a new jet engine and it keeps burning out and burning out and burning out. <laughs> and somebody comes and says, you know, the way that's hooked together there and there and there, if we just turn this this way, I think we can rev it up that much higher and that thing is going to be fantastic. So he did that. And then the rest is history. Dave? I have one more question. Yeah. Um, it's sort of combining tonight with also a session you held a few weeks ago around um, helping uh, people when they're dying. Yeah. Um, so I have a very good friend of mine who's uh, sort of one of my best friends from primary school. He, they're a Catholic family, mm. uh, quite close to them, quite close to his mum and dad. So his dad's been in the hospital for... Um, almost a week now they're not they don't think he may not make it so he's yeah. he's had a long history of diabetes kidney issues and failures so he's um doing a procedure on monday so i'm only in contact with my friend through whatsapp and messaging and that's my main way of communicating to him and i don't have direct contact to his father who's in hospital or his mother at the moment um I can text his mother, but what can I, as a, a friend and also a practicing Buddhist, but what can I share, given what you've talked about tonight, but also, you know, you talked about, about pain management, but also, you know, we don't know if he's going to pass away, but you mentioned a few weeks ago about the helping people when they're passing and giving them an opportunity, you know, to face that in a peaceful way for the next in his life or how can I, whether it's a text to him or his mom, is there a way I can give there's them really, something? There's, you know, we try, what I try to do is bridge this by, by you, every case is different and you have to find out where the person is talking about death. And if they're at the point where he's nearly, uh, you know, where he doesn't have very long, they've already faced and talked about death. And in the Catholic sense, you have to understand what's going on if they're, if they're active Catholics, all right? So he's going, he's going, he's going to heaven mm. or, or wherever he's going, okay? He's going. And this is what he believes. So you don't touch that. 
you're not, it's not your place to touch anything like that. But the discussion we had on the whiteboard, is that Buddhist? No, hmm. that's universal. So one of the ways to do this, I, I would send you one place. Um, what's the name of that place in New York? Uh, you can get it online. I want to say eternal temple, but that's not it. What you, uh, humanistic, humanistic approach to Buddhism. If you go on fish around with the humanistic approach to Buddhism. And a few weeks ago, I think I may have come out and said to you all, I said, you know, when I look at this whole thing, I can't get a handle on this is a religion that is an isolated religion. The Buddha didn't do this whole thing to, to have a religion and set up and leave a religion. He did this as a quest to find the, the cause, the suffering, the cause and the cessation of suffering in a humanistic line of approach to all humanity. This is why I tell you to sit and, and um, send loving kindness and compassion to Beirut with what happened, mm. you see? Because these people, 200, 350,000 or 400,000 or something are out of their homes instantly. And you know, take a look at how hot Beirut is. There's no AC in 90% of the city. 90% of a city with 2.4 million people. How are they gonna pull it off? How many old people are gonna pass away? What exactly is gonna happen, you see? They've had such a rough time, such a rough history, so many bombings and all the rest of it for like 20, 30 years. And then they clean everything up and they built this city. And now here they are with every window from a sonic boom that moved the speed of sound through that city. And it's the largest explosion that's a non-nuclear explosion in the history that's recorded other than a nuclear weapon. You see, it's non-nuclear. It's the largest explosion that's ever had. Any, anyway, to speak to people, you want to speak to them from the story of the lifeline. And everybody is born, everybody dies, everybody passes along the lifeline. And did you ever think about the idea that, you're, that the depression and the stress and everything comes from thinking about how things happened before in the past and it's all happening again to me, you see? And it's a heavy load when someone passing away because why is this happening to us? And yet, did you ever think, what would it, wouldn't it be neat, in their case, you would say like, wouldn't it be neat if that wasn't true that nothing was happening to us? And, and everything was happening from us, what do you think it would be like if we could choose how we see things? Is that Buddhist? You see what I'm saying? So you, you, talk, you think about the material and you say to yourself, can you talk to somebody who's non-Buddhist non about these things? And then, you know, um, the, the, the idea, of, especially for them, if they haven't done it, if they're this close, you know, get busy, especially if the family's all falling apart around him. They don't need, if they would only see, they don't need to do that. The sympathy and empathy and compassion thing is important to understand. Sympathy is for when they died, you give everybody sympathy. And you take them food while they're going through this whole thing and stuff like that. Empathy is a rough thing to explain. Some people I found out think that empathy, it's important for you to feel what somebody else feels. But you know, Ingrid, if I come to your house and you're devastated and you can't even move and you're in shock over something, if I feel that way too, do you think that I can help you much? I can't, can I? So a real empath is a person they have problems today. A person who is a real empath can actually feel what's happening for the other person and they don't realize it and they're overwhelmed and it can wipe them out and exhaust them. So if we understand empathy, it's important to understand it because if you find out you are sensitive, you want to go, whoa, whoa, whoa. What's real here? What is the truth in this situation? The truth is I know that say, you know, Ingrid has something happening 
and she's in pain. I can see that she's in pain, but I have the knowledge to know clearly her pain is her pain and I can't take her pain away. Can I? I can't. She has to be able to do that. Okay. So the next piece of it is I want to be compassionate. So I know these two things. This is her, it's painful, but it's her pain and I can't take it away. The third step is I want to be compassionate. I want actively to be compassionate. I don't want to say, oh, I send you a lot of loving kindness and compassion. I'm so sorry this is happening to you. And I go to work. <laughs> no, I want to actively be compassionate. So how do I be actively compassionate? is I then look at the situation and say, well, she's cold and she needs a blanket or she needs someone to be with her if nobody's there, to just be in the room or sit beside her, not to talk to her, not to go in the hospital room and fix the curtains and move the chair and fold the blanket and say, I just visited Aunt Sue. Gee, she's having a rough time. That's not it. That's not it, okay? To listen as much as possible to her if she can speak if she's if they're unconscious to be sending loving kindness to them the whole time that you're there and let's not kid ourselves about this if anybody teaches loving kindness is just a practice and it's not a power if you ever hear this it only means that person never felt the loving kindness and had somebody respond to them who was far away but it happens i had a student in uh, in Bali, I'm teaching the person, the woman loving kindness. And this is really famous, this now story now. It's, it was the most amazing thing to go through. And she owned the place and she had a friend she chose for her spiritual friend, that per, a person who was in Texas, in Austin, Texas. And she had gone to college and roomed with the person 12 years before. And now the thing about this is that she had not seen this person or been in contact with the person for 12 and a half years. You got it? Okay. Okay. So now what happens is she's, she's saying to me, I don't think I'm doing this right. I don't think I'm, I'm doing, I'm sending it hard enough. I just keep her in my mind and I smile and I take walks over. I, I don't, I'm not sure. I just don't think, you know, and she was so all this doubt. And I kept saying, just do it. Keep doing it and see what happens. She walked up the stairs out of the interview place and I was interviewing someone else and she came running back down. Why? Because when she went up the stairs, the man who works there said she had a call on the phone and she went to the phone and her friend was calling her. She was absolutely shocked that this had happened. And I said, I try to explain to you, it's a real kind of energy that comes off of you and they can measure it now. And they know the, um, the tonal quality, the tone for it. And they know how to make it grow in your body now. And they can see it. People who can see the auras can see the auras go from here out like this. You see, you remember the paintings, the religious paintings, where you have somebody like an angel or uh, Mary or Jesus and has this big light here. It's because there is a light there and it's really expanding, you know, because he's living, breathing and acting in loving kindness. Same with the Buddha. I think the same with Krishna personally. <laughs> Krishna is so happy. <laughs> she has this eminence playing the flute, you know, all the time and making people happy, you see? So this is existing not in one place in religion, but in many, many different places, you see? So the feeling of this for sick people, for unconscious people in an accident, and for people in a coma, they can feel this happening around them. And when they come out or come back to consciousness, they have this tremendous amount of comfort because if they talk to you about it later, because somebody was there sending this towards them the whole time, you can feel this stuff. So that's what I mean when I say I went to the teacher and I knocked on the door and he said, what's up? And I said, oh, this stuff is real. <laughs> I never knew it was real. I was doing it for two years and I didn't really know it was real. 
I just knew I had a lot of time in my life right then and I could do whatever he wanted me to do and I kept doing it, you see? And uh, this stuff turns out to be very, very real. So you teach them how to send loving kindness and compassion to each other. You teach them how to, uh, don't worry about the whole program, but to teach loving and kind thoughts towards each other. And it's sort of like, and you can do it for the whole group. And you teach them that when they are, he's having something done in the hospital, that they're sending loving kindness to him. But even him, if he's conscious, he's sending it to the doctors and nurses around him. And everything goes better, it goes smoother. From a lot of people who have gone to the hospital have told us that, you know. So this is the kind of thing you do. You, so you have the notebook, you have loving kindness, you have compassion is universal in all the religions I know in the Catholics and the, um, the Church of England and the Lutherans and Protestants are all teaching types of meditation that are similar, you know. Um, uh, Christian centering prayer is a Catholic invention that's almost identical to TWIM. The only difference between what they're doing and we're doing is at the end of the, pr of the prayer circle, if you all come and sit in a circle and sit for the evening together like this, the only difference in what they're doing, um, there's no heavy concentration, is at the end of what you're doing that evening, you say a little prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And that's it. And you ask him to come in in the beginning and the presence of the Holy Ghost to be there. And then you do this whole thing. And at the end, you say in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And that's, that's a Christian centering prayer circle. And when I read about how they teach it and everything, I can't find much of a difference at all. You see? There's many fine people involved in that in Missouri, and it started in an abbey that was north of St. Louis in Missouri. I can't remember the name of the abbey. It was a father, a Christian father. He died now. But it's all over the world. So what we're doing is Buddhist, but it's not, it's more humanistic, and it is more um, something that we can give to anyone. You just... Um, and as a Buddhist, you're not trying to convert anybody. <laughs> you see, if the Catholics come into your room, they're trying to make sure that you're Christian before you die, <laughs> which is okay. That's what they believe. <laughs> they should do this. They should save you. But in the Buddhist sense, all we have is promulgation. We don't have proselytizing. We have promulgation. It means I have to keep learning all of this and have it and keep it as an encyclopedia. I become a walking encyclopedia. It's my dedication in life. So you're supposed to be able to knock on this and ask a question. If I don't know, I will find out and come back and tell you. But most of the time now, it's pretty, pretty good. I can usually answer, okay? Everybody okay? You dead yet? <laughs> I'm wondering. Okay? We should uh, wrap it up. We are already uh, above our time. It is nine. I'm sure. <laughs> okay. 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 Here we go. Ready? May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth. May yours and others of mighty power share this light of ours. Thank you. <laughs> Davis and Nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddhist dispensation.